There's an old Zen proverb that says, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And many people are confused by that. What that means is, I'm going to do the same things I was doing before. What changes is how I show up in doing them. The energy, the presence, um, the response, if you will, that I bring to it. You're going to do the same things. The world is still going to be the world. Um, those that, that that reach a state of quote unquote enlightenment, which you never get there, by the way, it's a it's a it's an evolutionary process. Um, but you're not all of a sudden this <laughs> this wise you know Zen uh, person that the, the movies and stuff portray. It's just that you bring a different awareness um, and and innate intelligence and wisdom and calmness to every situation. And so in crisis, the first thing people want to do is let's say they've been doing all those things. They've been doing their meditation. They've been uh, hydrating and working out and eating well, um, and they're really taking care of themselves. And things are going great. And then crisis happens. What's the first thing everyone does? Welcome back to another edition here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Falkobik Kali, your host. And today I'm super excited because I'm looking out and we are seeming to sit in a perfect storm right now and a perfect storm usually is not only pretty or unpretty rather to look at but it seems that everything ha is happening at the same time be it the climate crisis geopolitical risk uh, we have actually a war the recession the interest rates so people are really starting to feel a little bit uneasy about what is going on another crisis and remember <laughs> i started Mentory TV during the COVID crisis because I was so bored and I said, okay, I need to know what other people are thinking about what's going on and what's going to happen in future. And somehow we are kind of circling uh, nicely back also because of COVID to a rather uncomfortable situation. So I came across this book, which I thought was absolutely marvelous, the Zen Executive, Gems of Wisdom for Enlightened Leadership. And the reason why it caught my eye is quite simple. I also have a company, I'm part of a team, I'm part of a partnership, and leadership of the question of how to handle on one side the exterior of the company and on the other side the interior of a company, which is nothing but fantastic people, all right, is certainly a challenge, especially when things seem to start looking a little bit uneasy. So I thought, why not invite Jim Blake to the show? And he came to speak about his book. Jim, good to see you. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to spend some time with you today. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I'm going to quiz your brain because what you have to say in the book, I think, comes extremely handy obviously at the best of times, but I think right now um, to keep things together in a certain way, the way that you describe it is important. A couple of words on you. Um, Jim Blake, since 2016, you are actually the CEO of Unity World Headquarters, which is a nonprofit organization. What you're looking at at Unity is something very dear to my heart, which is trying to spread the world word of spiritual practices it doesn't matter what culture, it doesn't matter what religion or faith you have. It's about spirituality, which already kind of introduces that uh, the religious faith might not be the same thing as spirituality. So, um, Jim, let's delve, delve straight into it. And the first thing I was looking at was, of course, the title, The Zen Executive. And why it intrigued me was because it sparked two thoughts in my mind. The first one was, Zen. And a lot of people that might not necessarily be into the Zen approach might go like, oh, yeah, these are the lazy people. You know, they sit and meditate and they go like, whatever, have their chance and then they're happy ever after on one side. And on the other side, you have executive. And the word executive derives from execution, action, uh, even a proactive approach. Okay. Tell us a little bit about. Um, how you came about your journey yourself and mm -hmm. then to arrive at the at the point of writing the Zen executive. 
Sure. So I'll start way back. Um, early on, I wasn't exposed to much in terms of spirituality and religion. In fact, the only thing religious in my household was my mother would religiously put me on the Sunday school bus to a Baptist church down the road a bit. And so that was my first exposure to any sort of formal religion. After I aged out of that program, uh, I didn't really have much exposure beyond that. And uh, until I got to college, where I took my first world religions course, and I was, I found myself just struck by all the different faith traditions and the golden, what I call the golden threads of truth that sort of ran through all of them. And just that there was beauty in each and every one of them. And so that really uh, set me on my path. I guess I was always innately a seeker, but that really turned on that light for me. And so I went on to study Buddhism for a while. I have studied the eight limb path of yoga. I have studied Hinduism, uh, obviously different facets of Christianity, and so just a lot of New Age practices and energy work. And over time, the more that I began to delve into all these different philosophies and teachings, I was also on uh, a path in the corporate world. I came from very meager beginnings, so I was convinced that the path to happiness was prosperity and wealth and, and big titles and houses and cars. And so I had set some goals for myself. And, and uh, as I was on those two journeys, I'll probably say in my early to mid thirties, um, I had each of them compart compartmentalized up until that point, but they began to, I began to not be able to do that anymore. And so what was happening was the things that were these universal truths about our values and how we show up in the world weren't necessarily aligning with the experiences I was having in the corporate world. And I began to experience all sorts of, um, I would, I would call it, um, unproductive leadership, uh, mostly resulting in, in people being unhappy and, and not as productive as they could, very unhealthy cultures, a lot of fear and intimidation and command and control. And it just, it was at odds with this other, other part of my life. And so I began to work on sort of my own idea of what it might look like to lead from a spiritual place. Um, and uh, the more I did that, the more it began to take hold and yield uh, unexpectedly a lot of good fruit. And uh, it actually turned out to be sort of the opposite of, of, of this fear and intimidation and command and control. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But so how I got to the book was over time, I thought, okay, I have now studied this. I've done it. It works. How do I, how do I help other people understand that you can lead in a different way? And how do I help people understand that you can be far more productive with a healthy regimen of self-care, which we can talk about and how you can basically especially in times like these where there's chaos everywhere and you feel totally powerless because everything is going awry. What I do in the book is provide these gems of how you can make an impact in your sphere of influence, not only in your own life, but with those that serve with you. And so when you feel like you're doing nothing, you'll actually be able to do something. And so um, the book was really motivated by the idea that if we could get any, any other leaders, just even one leader, to read this book and change the way they lead, the influence that it will have um, will be enough. And the more people that read it and can lead this way, the more yeah. they will impact those that serve on their team. So mm -hmm. that's how I got here. Yeah, and I, I I like that because your first chapter, the inside the inside job, I think, is exactly where it all starts, right? Mm -hmm. Because it must start with your own perception of, I guess, what is going on outside of you and whether that resonates in a certain way with you or it doesn't. And what I thought was very interesting in what you were just saying, you know, I was studying spirituality and also religion. So maybe you want to talk about what the difference there really is in hindsight of your studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, you, in, in intrinsic um, desire to get uh, practically from the American dream, you know, from the bottom to the top and accumulate things that one should have in order to really show um, success, validation, a place in society. Interesting, I thought, was your choice of words because instead of saying profits and money, you use prosperity, which I think is already 
if I may say so, uh, tainted in a positive way by your spiritual mindset. Because prosperity goes beyond what most people would label as money or profits. Yeah, you are spot on. And that's a, a very astute observation. So we'll, I'll start back with what you said about the inside job. Um, anything we do in this world begins with your own inner perception and your lens of how you view the world, which in turn influences how you show up in the world. And so the Zen part that you, you asked about earlier is really about, there are lots of uh, suggestions in the book about how to get your plate, get yourself to a place of center where you've, you're, you're self-accepting, you understand what your gifts are. Your and I know by the way that that chase of material things that I talked about uh, very early on, I found out that was not my secret to happiness. That wasn't uh, you know what was driving me. And so it's this inner work that you sort of have to do. I call it, uh, a lot of work in self awareness, um, beginning to understand who you are innately and what really drives you and inspires you as a person, and then getting really comfortable with it, despite what others think you should do. Um, just being comfortable. I like to say your individual expression, that is your superpower. Stop trying to conform to what the world thinks you should be and really own your own uh, unique expression. And when you begin to do that, you this, this um, natural self-confidence, natural self-love begins to express in a really powerful and charismatic way. And you begin to be open to a whole bunch of uh, inspiration and creativity that you might not have been open to before because you were trying to be something that you weren't. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because you're talking about the path, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, of becoming. So you're recognizing what or what not you may or may not be, what you would accept about you, and, and then you're kind of like becoming. It is an internal, not only job, but it's an internal journey. And okay. according to that, again, let me pick up uh, on you know the, the word money and that it didn't bring you happiness. I find, for example, money is something that is not talked about enough simply because money is a fantastic tool. Right. It's something that goes through us. It is not us. And I think this is maybe the part where a lot of people go like, okay, I amass money and products and that makes me happy. But I think it makes me and it makes you also happy to have the funds, the money to enable other people's whatever, be it talents, objectives, dreams, visions. Yeah, I talk about in the book that, that money is really just the energy of exchange. It happens to be the energy of exchange in this, in this particular society. And the focus on... <clears throat> being content with yourself and doing whatever it is that most inspires you. If you do those things and you do it with a heart of service, the money, the performance, the productivity, those all take care of themselves. Um, doesn't mean I don't like nice things. I still do. But what I have found on my, on my way to success is that if I focus less on the material outcomes and focus on the work that I want to do to get there, and it comes from a, a, a place that's center of my heart, all that stuff takes care of itself. And, and we all will be so prosperous. And prosperity, as you mentioned, goes beyond just wealth. So it, it shows up in terms of uh, rich relationships and profound experiences and all kinds of synchronicities that show up in your life in terms of being in the right place at the right time and meeting the right people. Uh, so prosperity is a much bigger umbrella of all of the good things that happen um, and 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 well beyond just the concept of of money. Uh, absolutely. Let's return to that question about uh, you know once you are enlightened, because in a way, uh, Jimmy had an enlightenment. You said, okay, you know there there are certain things that I would would be endorsing as a spiritual practice, and through the practice you actually become. I mean, I study Kabbalah, and you know we are here to become, not to be. That is our that is our principle. And what can we do the next day that gets us a little bit closer, over, helps us overcome whatever we are facing? Mm -hmm. And once you're there, you said, you know, I I was an executive. You were in the IT uh, in the IT world. Um, where, of course, there's a lot of pressure. There is innovation pressure. There is people wanting to get the next product out. There is a lot of competition simply because this is where the world was also or is still evolving. And then you have those two paradigms, I'd call it, like an old paradigm and the new paradigm of leadership. And you found yourself with that inner, I would call it mindset, spirituality is a mindset, because whether I work or I am in a private setting, or I chat to you, I have a certain mindset 
which is me. It's not like, okay, I have a spiritual tool. Yes, I do. But the entire mindset, of course, is what you would call either a spiritual approach or a non-spiritual approach. So would you say that in your own experience, you soon could see who was actually, and I would like you to, to define this, who was a leader and who was a boss? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Um, and, and so when you, when you talk about this concept of boss, you're talking about people who believe that being a leader is telling someone what to do and telling them how to do it and pushing and pushing and pushing. And what I want to say is, and I, and I go into detail in this in the book, but I'll, I'll just give you some examples. Mm -hmm. So let's contrast someone who is a boss who leads through fear and intimidation. So every day they are pushing their team. Um, they're often berating them, uh, some, some form of verbal assault. Here's what that does. That person, when they come to work for eight hours a day, is in a constant state of anxiety and fight or flight. And oh, by I the mean, way, the hormones, you know, right. they're full of adrenaline and cortisol. They're like, right. this is why people have heart attacks on Sunday nights and Monday mornings, right? Because of, of this sort of thing. And so, I um, thought it was they spent too much time with the other half. I don't know. Okay. They, uh, what ends up happening is, by the way, you can't leave that at the office. And so it goes home. This person is now in this state of stress and that it, it uh, results maybe in road rage or an argument with the spouse or how I treat my pet or children. I mean, it literally has a, a ripple effect. And I can give you my own personal moment of awakening around this in a few minutes. But now contrast that. And by the way, so in this state, how productive do you think they are? Do you Not they, they're, you're getting their most productive and creative and inspired work? You're not. They're scared to make a mistake. Um, there's no creativity. They're certainly not going to bring you any new ideas because they don't want to be ridiculed or, or anything like that. So contrast that with a leadership style. Um, I, the one I talk about in the book is, is called servant leadership. But just generally, if you if your role as the leader is to say, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to provide you with the best environment I can so that you're comfortable and productive. I'm here to remove obstacles that may get you in the, get in the way of you uh, performing at your highest level. I have, have uh, relegated myself as the, the leader to be the least important in the person in the organization because you that are doing the day-to-day -day task activities are the most important. So my role is to support you, to see you, to hear you, to make sure you feel uplifted, um, to thank you for being here. So if you do all of those things and lead with that sort of thing. Now, let's look at that person. How productive do you think they are every day versus the other person, right? Mm -hmm. They're comfortable. They're inspired. They're happy to be there. The comp All the companies in the world are seeking this elusive idea of engagement. Treat your associates this way. They'll automatically be engaged. They'll be grateful to be there with you. They leave each day with no stress and no anxiety. So now they go out into the world and they show up content and happy they're not you know they're not road raging or any of those things because of this so that's the influence and power we have as leaders now the first challenge i always get is okay jim if you're going to lead with compassion and being mr nice guy you can't hold people accountable and my argument i always say why not i can certainly still go to someone with a list of facts and data here's what we asked you to do here's what's not being done there's a disconnect there is there some way i can help you get there um, if not, I'm going to need you to get there by this particular time frame. So you get you get where I'm going here. You can have the same accountability conversation. You just do it with well, from a, a place of humanity <laughs> and uh, and and just focus on the facts and data. You don't have to berate someone or make them feel less than because they're not not doing their job. And so exactly. you can still very oh. much hold people accountable. We very much do, even in a culture where we lead with servant leadership. Um, if you can't perform at a particularly high level, then you can't be with us. And that's not a that's not a bad thing. That doesn't make us not compassionate. It just makes us uh, incompatible. <laughs> it doesn't make you hate them. But yeah, yeah. Exactly. no, it, to it no, Jim, it totally makes sense. And I think, uh, you know, leading from a place of inclusion and being a facilitator as a leader, you're a true leader. Yeah, because um, we always say in our company, leaders listen. And only if you listen, you start really knowing your community, because at the end of the day, what is a company, be it a small company, medium sized or big blue chip company, it's a bunch of people. Yeah. 
And before, you know, selling any of these kind of products or producing them, whatever, you need to have the main input here. And that is the person that creates or executes and does that in a, a very happy mindset where fear, which is blocking anything that might have to do, as you were saying, with creativity or just, you know, cooperation and a can-do attitude is canceled out. And I think that is super important. I wonder, now let me let me now be a little bit controversial because I totally divide what you're saying. Oh, con- con- oh God, I'm getting my, my, my language just mixed up. Anyway, I, I totally su- support what you're saying. To what extent is, you know, the execution and the implementation of this mindset of a leader, of a facilitator, of, as you were saying, a servant leader like uh, Greenleaf, I think, that's, that's oh, okay. came through, okay. right? Um, how do I implement it? Because one thing is, you know, between you and I, we can kumbaya, all right? Then we have a bigger group, and that is already, okay, I need to know more or less what can I facilitate to whom and what do they need in order to get their goals done, which serves the overall goal. Then you have a team, Mm -hmm. and then you have profit centers, and then you have your big, big blue chip. And I think um, to get everybody on the same page, you as a leader are not facing perhaps also the, um, the risk of being exploited, for being good, even though we talk about uh, accountability, but a lot of people get away with what or try to get away with what they get away with mm-hmm. on one hand. And on the other hand, where you actually are an inclusive servant leader, a facilitator, has a happy team. And then the next profit center down the corridor has a different culture. Mm-hmm. So what, how yeah, do you that, deal with that? That, w- that is a remarkable observation. And, and in the book, I talk about this, but I think that's the single biggest mistake that organizations make in trying to uh, create a healthy culture because you, you've you described it perfectly. What happens is if I'm, a, if I'm under a leader who's compassionate and, and leads with all the characteristics we spoke about in this big company, I'm having an amazing experience. I'm fulfilled. I'm content. I feel heard and seen and appreciated. And then I go to work over in this division where the leader is command and control and I feel um, stifled. Uh, I feel like I can't bring any suggestions forward. Same company, same benefits, same meditation room, same game rooms, all of those things. But I'm having a completely different experience of that culture. I don't appreciate it. I don't feel nearly as valued as the other person who thinks this is the greatest place to work on planet Earth. And so mm-hmm. my recommendation is just what you alluded to. I don't care what you call the leadership philosophy. I don't care how you define it, but it has to be standardized across every single leader in the organization. So we chose servant leadership. There's a book called The Servant that we read as a leadership team. It's basically a story. It's written in story form, but it goes over the principles of what it means to be a servant leader. Every leader in our company has to go through an eight-week book study of that book And then we require that they embody those principles. And if at any point in time we become aware that you are not leading in this uh, framework, then you can't be with us anymore um, for just these reasons. Because we want people to be able to, no matter where they work in the organization, they're all having the same experience of our culture and they can expect um, the same style of leadership. It doesn't mean that all the leaders will be the same because everybody will embody those principles differently um, and in their own unique way, but generally speaking, associates will be treated the same way and have the same experience wherever they go. So that that's how that's the best way to really handle that. And, and I love this. And I think in the framework, the work of Unity, for example, um, it's almost quite an easy way to get that implemented and really executed and lived every single day, be it as a leader, be it as a team. How about, you know, I'm going down to Wall Street or I'm going to the city of London or I'm going to, to Paris down to the, the, the fashion houses, et cetera, where everything seems to be more doggy dog. There's a lot of pressure in terms of uh, commanding respect results and also revenues. You know, how do we handle this? How do we, how would we start, you know, even as a startup or a smaller company uh, or a big, big blue chip to implement this mindset from the top to the C uh, C level, yeah, C suit to yeah. the real team. Is it? I mean, how easy or not is it? Where where are the main obstacles? 
Well, certainly the higher up you are in the organization, the greater influence you have to be able to to do these sorts of things. Um, As individuals, it becomes challenging. And so there's some ways like in your own department. So first of all, my first recommendation is model it. I guarantee if you model this way of being and or leading, people will notice. Number one, they'll notice how you always seem to come from a place of calm and center and you're responding to whatever's in front of you, not reacting. And there's a difference there, right? So if you've done that inner work, um, you're able to sort of take, uh, Victor Frankl has a quote that he says, between stimulus and response, there's a space. Yes. And it's that space where we get to choose, right? So many of us, um, and me, me, uh, obviously in my past, I never chose to respond. I just reacted. And that's when we we are not showing up as our best self because it's coming from emotion or you know, the, the, the chatter in the mind. So all that to say, um, le- uh, model it first, and then you can bring in things uh, under the umbrella of team building or under the umbrella of greater productivity um, that teach these sort of principles. And most leaders will embrace that idea. They'll be open to, you know, having someone come in and speak and teach us this, especially if it's going to lead to to greater productivity. What I will tell you is in some of the places you described, Wall Street and some of those those hardcore, um, old school leadership paradigms, it, uh, unless they are all open to it, it would be difficult to implement it from the top down. Um, so you would have to start in smaller circles. I guess that's part of the reason I wrote the book was to help people understand that at these top levels, you can lead this way and get even greater results than you're getting. And it's different. But I will say, having worked at a global leader leading this way, I did not fit. I was the odd man out. In fact, the title of the book comes from a story that I tell in the book. Um, so I'm a, a relatively big gentleman. I, I, I played college football and some semi-pro. And I had a boss tell me after a particular meeting we had, um, because I stayed very calm and present. and, and uh, A gentle kept, giant. A gentle yes, giant. Kept it from exploding. And so when we left the meeting, um, I'm paraphrasing here, the, story, the full stories in the book. But he basically said, hey, when I hired you, I thought I was getting a linebacker that was going to come in and take command and transform my business. And he said, you're like some sort of weird Zen master. (laughs) So he didn't, he couldn't relate to that leadership style. He was very pleased with the results. We were one of the top performing divisions in the company, but in his mind, he had been um, his entire life. He had spent in that command and control leadership style. So he really struggled with, with how we were performing so well when I wasn't leading with an iron fist in terms of uh, yeah. our approach. Yeah, but that's the difference between a boss and an enlightened leader, I guess, to yeah. to implement exactly that. And in uh, your book, you also talk about, you know, the mission, um, that you're on a mission, and you talk about affirmations. And, you know, uh, being spiritual is extremely personal, and you might, and I think that is the biggest challenge to get really everybody on the same page. But I thought in your book, you described it very cleverly. You know, yeah, affirmations, you may, you may not believe in the law of attraction, or that your thought really creates certain emotions. With those emotions, you have certain emotions, and hence, you may create your reality, positive or not depending on your inner chat, as you were saying, that you just called that mission a motto. So if you have a mission statement as a corporation, that's easier to sell to right. your employees. Right. Like Kind of like, okay, it's like like a corporate thing, but you have to kind of remember, you know, repeat, 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 and all of a sudden you become it because they start living it in every move, in every phone call, email you make. It becomes the part, uh, a part of who you are and how you act. Exactly. And so I'll give you, so affirmations really, in general, from a spiritual perspective, are designed to help us uh, either break a a, a uh, spiral of negative thinking or help us change a way that we're thinking and behaving. So we don't like the way we're thinking and behaving. We want to change that. We use this idea of affirmations. So instead of going around and saying, uh, I'm the unluckiest person in the world, which by the way, if you do that, Everything you see that happens, you frame it up in that lens. So even if it wasn't really about the That's fact quantum that quantum physics, quantum right. physics applied, exactly. <laughs> you, so you see what you're looking even, for. <laughs> if it wasn't even about that, that's what you see it as, right? And so let's say you want to change that. So you begin saying, I am the luckiest person in the world. I am. So now every little thing that happens that's positive, you begin to notice. And all of a sudden, um, you feel like the luckiest person in the world. So your thoughts 
And emotions really do have uh, an impact on how you experience life because it's how you're framing everything you see. So you're framing your experience based on the thoughts that you're carrying in in your head. And so um, these affirmations or so in the corporate world, I knew I was going to have to make a lot of change at a new position I started. So instead of calling it an affirmation, I went in and told the team and said, listen, um, we've got a lot of opportunity for improvement here. We're going to do a lot of change. So here's our mantra. Change is our friend, because we all know in the corporate culture, people have a lot of difficulty with a lot of change. They hate it. They hate it. So it's I put up signs. I said it in every meeting. And it got to a place where, you know, a few months in, I would say, okay, what's our mantra? And they'd all go, change is our friend. Because <laughs> like, yay. Because yeah, they knew we were going to make some more changes. But that's a perfect example of using like a, a spiritual tool or resource in a way to change a mindset of an entire division to make them open to the possibility of change. So your mission statement works the same way. If you create a short and meaningful and powerful mission statement, Everyone in your organization has bought into it. You've now got all this energy and emotion that's bought in to this particular statement, which informs the way you do business and how you show up to your customers, your suppliers, and to each other. So um, it can be a really powerful tool, especially if uh, it's really connecting with everyone. And the, the shorter it is and the more it connects with why you're really doing what you do, the more that people will use it. So for instance, the mission statement we have here is to help and serve more people through uh, prayer and publishing and community. The reason it's so powerful for us, I'll tell you, the majority of the employees only remember the first part, to help and serve. It's created an entire culture of service just because of the, the mission statement. I will also tell you from a leadership perspective, we use it as a touchstone. So let's say we want to make an acquisition or we're going to start a new line of business. The first question we ask is, how does this help us support the mission of helping and serving more people. The purpose. Does, right? You're talking about right. purpose here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so that's the power of having um, a really awesome mission statement or purpose statement is that it can become a touchstone for how you make decisions. It can become a rallying cry. The more people you have thinking the same way, moving in the same direction, the more momentum you have and the greater success you're going to have. So um, it can be a really powerful tool. It's not the uh, the outer facing mission statement, hey, look, this is what we think about ourselves or, or we want to be the best or this. Really use it as a tool to inform your business, engage your culture and create an identity for how you as an organization show up. And, and it can be really powerful. Absolutely. And interesting, and I'm just playing that scenario. Interesting is um, if I, let's say I'm in the finance business uh, and I, I am very spiritual, no, not very, you either are you or not, I'm spiritual, full stop. Uh, and I wonder, I was just listening to you and thinking, okay, so if I continue to work and also hire people, how would um, I guide as a spiritual inclined leader my interviews with these people, what would be, what would you say I could already filter through those people that say, yeah, 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 of course I am spiritual. And yeah, I love your, your statement, your mission statement. Yeah. And of course, serving as my, my ut utmost purpose, um, just to get the job from those that really live it. Yeah. So, um, there's a couple of things I, I would couple the mission statement, obviously with, uh, whatever you deem as your core values. And there's, there's two things you do with those. The mission statement we've talked about, I, I advocate for taking your core values and putting them in your performance management system. So each year when you're getting your review on how you perform your job function, you're also being reviewed on how well you express or embody the core values. And I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. But back to your question of the interview, you begin to center some interview questions around whatever your core values are and ask them questions about how they've expressed that or experienced that in a previous role. Ask them why, what is their why for, for wanting to be there? Not, I love your mission statement, I love what you do, but why? what personally is driving you to be a part of this? What do you bring to it? What do you see as an outcome? When you ask those sorts of questions, you really start to get some insight as to who the person is and what's true. driving them mm -hmm. internally. Um, and that'll give you a good uh, idea of whether they're uh, the right fit for the organization. If they're all about numbers and performance and that's not really your culture, which by the way, those are not bad things. Um, 
But we if they're, to make money to continue to live and give jobs. Yeah. At the end of the day, this is what I was trying to say about money being a tool. Capitalism is yeah. a tool if it's done the right way. Well, I'll give you another example. This is a if for people that are familiar with call centers. There's a measurement in a call center that's called the answered call rate. And what that measurement is is how many calls are coming in. How many of those? How many calls are you actually answering of all of those that are coming in? Right. And so if I am just focused on the numbers and performance, I'm going to my team and I say, have to get our answer call rate up. We have to do everything we can, shorter breaks, this, that, and the other. Versus how do I make that quote unquote spiritual? Well, it's very simple. Instead of focusing on that metric and the number, what I say is, how can we work together to serve more people? If we focus on the idea that we're able to serve more people that are trying to call and reach us, it changes the energy behind what we're doing and it's less about that number and more about how we can each individually be more helpful and of service. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. I mean, at the first listen to what you were saying, you could say ah, it's semantics, but it's not. It's a bit like prosperity and profits. There is a lot okay. more to the world. What, and uh, if you look at it, and I think the basic human being, and I tried to allude to it before, that you know, companies and products are just a reflection of the person behind, even though we are moving perhaps one day to, you know, singularity where uh, AI, uh, clever machines are just exactly that, <laughs> is, is <laughs> right. Um, I, I think the beauty in what you were just saying is that if we look at it, how can we serve the, the productivity, the motivation is different. So with a bigger motivation, a nicer motivation, it is stronger, you will serve more people and you will be inclined, motivated to pick up more, uh, more phone calls. The only spanner in the works here is, of course, if you have that kind of, how can I serve you motivation? Maybe your calls will be taking longer. Okay. And so on average, you will be serving fewer number of people, but the ones you served, you served well and you have a higher stickiness. So the longevity, the sustainability of your business, business model may be, may be helped on that front. All great observations and analysis. Yes, certainly that is possible. But as you said, you're going to develop deeper relationships. Um, but you'd be surprised that when you focus on that, uh, that what happens is in a desire to serve, people actually become more efficient. So they're very helpful. They're just quicker at how they're doing that. And they're eager to get on to, to help the next person. The next one. Let's talk about crisis because that was the beginning uh, of our conversation from crisis to creation. And, uh, you know, I always wonder, you know, when I, when I talk to my Kabbalah teacher, he said, you know, you cannot impose and it's wrong to impose a religion on a child or spirituality. It, it does not come to you. You come to it, be it the faith, the religion, the, the, the spirituality. You are on a quest as you were describing yourself. And only then it can actually make a difference to you and then to the, next of kin to the world through the ripple effect of your own energy, thinking, mindset, everything that we just talked about. So in a crisis, you always wonder, that's the moment when you start losing faith, be it in your spiritual belief, be it into your, in, your, in your religious belief, where you go like, come on, everything is falling apart. I can't believe it. I'm not. And it doesn't matter how many negative, you know, automatic negative thoughts like Daniel Amen likes to call them. You've been fighting also thanks to your mindset, but all of a sudden it's just far too much. And you kind of like go through that depth of the darkness of your soul and you feel disappointed that right now, everything falls to bits and um, you feel that the tools are letting you down. Juxtapose that with somebody that goes, oh my God, I've had a fantastic time, but I wasn't really going to church. I wasn't really doing my gratitude um, um, chants in the morning and I wasn't breathing or what have you, the energies in and out. And now I'm being punished. So they find their way and they start, okay, I'm going to church. I'm going to do my practices. What What's the situation here? What would you say to this kind of question? Because that is one of the questions that I don't know whether there is an answer, whether, what would you say? I mean, you, you and I... Well, let me, let's see if I can get, get there this way. There's an old Zen proverb that says, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And many people are confused by that. What that means is, I'm going to do the same things I was doing before. What changes is how I show up in doing them, the energy, the presence, um, the response, if you will, that I bring to it. 
you're going to do the same things. The world is still going to be the world. Um, those that, that that reach a state of quote unquote enlightenment, which you never get there, by the way, it's a it's a it's an evolutionary process. Um, but you're not all of a sudden this <laughs> this wise, you know, Zen uh, person that the, the movies and stuff portray. It's just that you bring a different awareness um, and and innate intelligence and wisdom and calmness to every situation. And so in crisis, the first thing people want to do is let's say they've been doing all those things. They've been doing their meditation. They've been uh, hydrating and working out and eating well. Um, and they're really taking care of themselves. And things are going great. And then crisis happens. What's the first thing everyone does? They set all that aside and they start, they quit doing it. And they're in the midst of this. And they stop doing whatever they were doing from affirmations and their mind is spiraling. And and so my, my first thing is when crisis happens, you should double down on whatever you were doing before. It's more important than ever that you do those things so that you stay centered. When I talk about staying centered, and and I know people, a lot of people are uncomfortable with meditation, but understand that meditation can be anything you want from sitting in nature, riding a bike, working out, uh, taking a walk. The idea behind meditation is just to step, uh, lean away from the constant spiral of the chattering mind and create a little bit of stillness and silence, create an opening for inspiration and for wisdom and creation uh to come through guidance to come through you can't you can't have that happen when you're in a constant thought spiral about the future the past or what i'm going to do next does that make sense Uh, it totally makes sense totally makes sense and um you know the 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 point you were just making step away this is exactly what a lot of people say oh i can't afford it i have to be here it's stress it's meetings it's this and that and logistics And to that, I say, you don't need to step away. You just need to breathe. You know, I mean, it sounds really so basic, but inspiration, you know, spirare, is is hoping, is breathing. And I mean, literally, physically, you know, the vagus nerve that is, you know, the parasympathetic nerve that is reacting to something so basic, which is our lifeline. So if you feel that you're drowning, of course, you're drowning because you're breathing, literally. Right. And right. I always say your meditation can just be hold your breath, breathe in really, really deep, hold it again and then breathe out for longer than you, breathe, you know, breathed in, um, as to say. And this is so basic. And when people go like, you know, just calm down, just take a breath and we go, whatever, whatever. Now, that is the most fundamental way, I'd say, to enter what it actually means to um, to handle anything and to just keep human rather than to you know digress into being just an animal fight flight uh mode because of the stress yep that's the very what you're describing is that space right between either reacting which is what we when we don't create the space or responding and when you can create lean away for a minute and allow a moment for inspiration or guidance by the way uh, i talk in the book about intuition So intuition isn't reserved for psychics and mediums. Every single one of us have an innate ability to have our own intuition, which is (laughs) uh, basically the wisdom of the universe that flows through all things. It tells the flowers how to bloom and the the acorn how to crack open and grow the tree. That innate intelligence is in, in us as well. And when we create space, it flows to and through us. Um, because we've created the stillness and how it shows up in the outer world. You may not in the moment get an aha or a brief thing, but you've created a space. And what happens is later, all of a sudden in the midst of something else, you'll go, oh my gosh, why don't we try this? Or you'll meet someone who inspires you or the, all these new little coincidences will start to happen. And it's all because you've created a space for the universe to uh, to align with what's happening with the flow of the universe, the unfolding flow of the universe, if you will. So back to your original question, double down on whatever got you there um, to this place of happiness and contentment before crisis. Do that during crisis. Double down on it. Uh, it's, it's vitally important. Yes. And it's even more important to maintain your mental and emotional health so that you're responding and not reacting in a crisis because you'll make your best decisions from the from the foremost posture rather than the the latter and on the other side um this idea that oh i didn't do this stuff and and these bad things are happening 
It's not in the form of guilt or retribution or someone's punishing you. It's that you have not created the space where you're at your center, where you're not taking care of yourself. And so now you're reacting instead of responding, which is why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. Yeah. I, uh, that to makes total sense. And I love that you brought intuition into the conversation, Jim, simply because um, I think that a lot of people have lost touch with themselves. And intuition is something they kind of like, you know, the sixth sense as well, or whatever, whatever, because they just get caught up in living and, and kind of living through the day and getting things done, taking things off rather than living their life in a you know purposeful way uh, in a mindful way and uh, it's very interesting my question is how do we find if we are raised like that very uh, let's say mm, target success orientated where you have to perform things mm -hmm. results uh, you know just be the best and at the same time not get caught up in it but still have that inner voice that you listen to because often we are, you know, in a society with certain rules and expectations, and that's the natural flow of an unenlightened person. And we'll just call it like that very arrogantly of a person that just, you know, is, is basically stops at our senses, what you can see, what you can touch, what you can smell, what you can feel that's real. Everything beyond just isn't. And I think everything beyond is just where life starts. To be perfectly right. honest. So how do you how do you get a person like this to listen again, get back to that intuition, which then you know changes everything about your own approach to yourself, you know, in your intrinsic self, and then also your ex extrinsic, extrinsic external uh, movements. I'm glad you asked because I was that person. I totally believe that intuition was for psychics and mediums and they were gifted people. And I would never have the ability to do anything like that um, for the good, a good portion of my life until I started studying these teachings and, and I kept seeing this over and over. And I hadn't, uh, I didn't have a meditation practice or anything, but I was in an environment where all the people I associated with did. So I gave in and I began to meditate. Uh, and it was two minutes to begin with. I mean, I just did it two minutes a day. And they told me the key was repetitive consistency. doesn't matter the length of time. Just do it every single day. Make habit, it a Make it a habit. Make it you. Mm -hmm. So I started doing it two or three minutes. And the, the, just within a few days, I sort of began to crave staying still longer. And it went from two minutes to five minutes to ten um, and, and, and in some cases later on in my, my practice, I would, I would sit for, for 30 minutes in silence, but I don't, it's about, for me today, it's about 15 minutes, but here's what happened when I did that. I began to experience everything I just told you. So I'm not making this up. This was my life experience all of the sudden. And I was super busy when I did this, I was going, uh, I was in a master's program and I was an executive at a thrive at a, at a growing organization. And I was also going to seminary. <laughs> so um, I had all of these things happening. And what started to happen was just what we talked about earlier. Little coincidences began to occur. People would show up and take things off my plate. Something that I thought had gone awry would shift and go a different way. I would have a whole different idea of how to do something different and easier. Other people would show up with ideas how to. So it, it just, um, as I mentioned, there is a divine unfolding of the universe. And when we're able to align with that energy, all of these things start to come together in a real powerful and meaningful way. And so um, here's the other thing that happened. I began to get what I would call gut feelings about things. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I didn't trust it. I didn't trust it. I thought, no, nah, oh. that, that, <laughs> that can't be true. That's not right. And so it took me years to be able to really lean into the intuitive hit I was getting. And even when I would trust it, I would white knuckle it all the way through. So I'm like, OK, I'm going to trust this, but I'm not sure if I believe it. And, um, and eventually what happened is I really began to understand that I could trust it. And the more I trusted it, the more it would yield positive results. And so here's the thing. Intuition shows up differently for everybody, just like meditation can be a walk or a or exercise, or whatever it is for you to create that space, intuition shows up differently for everyone. For some people, it's an actual voice that speaks clearly right into the depths of their mind. For others, it's a it's a physical feeling somewhere in their body. They can't explain it, but they have a feeling, and then a message comes forth 
um, some people see very clearly visuals and they have a, a visual thing that shows up for them that that delivers them um, some clarity and guidance. So it may show up different for you um, no matter who you are. And here's a here's a here's just a little evidence for you that everyone in the world has intuition. I guarantee you that everyone that's listening to this or anyone that that, that comes across this has had a moment where in the morning they thought they should do something, they ignored it, and then later in the afternoon they were like, dang. I knew I should have done that. Why didn't I listen? I know better than that, right? That is your intuition telling you in that moment. And so over time, when you begin to trust it and lean into it, it'll become a pattern where you will no longer question it. So when you get an intuitive hit, you just do it right there in the moment, or you just make that decision, or you just go that direction. Um, and it it it, uh, it will completely transform your experience of life. Does that help? It totally, totally. You know, I was I was raised with the mindset: follow your heart, but take your brain along. Mm -hmm. Okay, so which is of course the sweet spot, which is okay. You have your intuition, but now you have to try to live it, implement it, follow it in a constructive way, and not only egoistically in a constructive way, but it also that it makes makes sense. But uh, you mentioned the word guidance, and it made me um, think of Mahil Clerk who is a co-founder of the Jung platform and um, Sigge Jung. And he uh, wrote this book called Dream Guidance. And I was, uh, it's also on Mentory TV, that conversation. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, Jim, is very, very simple. As you were saying, everybody had this once upon a time, this, oh, I should have done, I should have done. I thought about it, why didn't I? And he teaches in his book, simple steps, how you can, before you go to sleep, Ask your inner self, the universe, yeah. which is nothing but your heritage as a soul, as an energy, being part of this overall energy, um, the questions you have. And with time, practice, and as you were saying, you know, you have to follow it through, you will get answers. And that is that is also a, a way to access not the, the nature, uh, the nurture, sorry, but the nature of who you are, because that does guide a lot. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. And I would just uh, just to bring this all around to from a practical business perspective, um, more and more, if you look around, you'll find quotes from some of the most successful business leaders in the world who have begun to actually uh, employ coaches and people to help them de develop their intuition. So this is slowly starting to make its way into uh, corporate culture. But I'll just give you an example. It doesn't mean that you throw away facts and data. And that you, you're just totally reliant on whatever this gut feeling is or the vision you have. Every day, we still take a look at the facts and data, which will point us in a particular direction. Then you just check in with your intuition as to whether that feels right, whether it needs to be modified slightly, or whether it doesn't feel right at all. So it's a combination of both. You don't ignore sort of what's showing up in the outer in terms of facts and data and and of course, obviously, in a world that's got uh, that's doubling its data in such rapid pace, data is super important. But you're also not relying solely on that either. So it's really learning how to combine the two in a really meaningful way that uh, that people are having great success in some exactly. of the. Exactly, and you you say that also in your book where you you look at that servant leadership just to close the circle on this one. Jim is basically the enlightened leader in a way is the one that still serves best practice. So mm -hmm. we still need to run that business and make a, a profit or become prosperous. At the same time, we can do it in a different way. And I think that is kind of like the core message is, listen, our system is the way it is. The message is still, you need to be accountable. We need to make this work. We need to, we need to survive long term. But it's the how you get there that can be very, very different, either top down shouting, you know, a very, very unhumane way of putting anything into practice or in a different, very clever and humane, i.e. incorporating our differences in beauty. Now, last question, the Zen executive. If yep. I am uh, finding myself in a C-suite, in a co corporation, and I would like to start, you know, leading my team a little bit more different, what are the three key things you would say you could advise me how to start and how to turn things around and have that ripple effect you also talk about throughout yeah. at least not only my team, but as much as I can, the corporation. 
So first things first, um, the first thing you have to have is a pretty decent relationship with the team. So if you haven't already, begin by just listening, really, really spending some time with each staff member, finding out what challenges they have, finding out about uh, what ideas they may have for improvement, all of that to start to build some trust and credibility. So if you listen to them, you begin to take care of some of these things that they've brought to you and you establish this, this place of trust and capability, I'm sorry, trust and credibility. And they begin to understand that, wow, our boss is really engaged with us and they're really listening to us. Um, so start there. And then the rest of it is really simple. It's checking in on your folks, checking in on their well-being, figuring out how you can help them. Checking in, them. sorry to drop, checking in rather than checking up. Correct. That's exactly right. In fact, uh, the founders of the Unity Movement used to walk around. We stole their practice, but they used to walk around and thank all their associates. We borrowed it and called it Walkabout Wednesday, where we just walk around. The entire executive team walks around to the different divisions on our 1,200-acre campus and just ask people, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? Anything you need? Um, so you just begin to, you're still asking people to do the same things they were doing and perform at a particular level. But you also care about their well-being and you want to make sure that when they're at work, they have whatever they need to perform at their highest level. That's really all it is. You're real. It seems um, it seems almost comical that we have to tell ourselves this, but you're really just trying to create the best space you can for the people that work on your team so they can be as successful as they can. And and it's nothing more than that. Caring for them and then thanking them. Um, acknowledgement. So many people just want to be acknowledged. It's one of the highest ranking rewards, period, across money, vacation time, you know, bigger office. People just want to be acknowledged. And so you're checking in, just like you said, you're acknowledging, you're thanking, um, you're creating this environment where they feel seen and heard and you have trust and credibility. That will begin you on a, a remarkable journey of, of uh, increased productivity, better engagement, and uh uh, really uh, uh, a lot of success. Absolutely. And I think fundamental here is also the sense of trust. You know, if you trust them, you empower. I think you empower people. I mean, one side, you give them tools to do as best as they can what they're expected to do in the job. And then you just trust them and let them run this, this kind of like checking up rather than checking in. And the moment I think one feels trusted, you feel validated and go like, I'm going to live up to that trust. I'm going to continuously show that I am an accountable, a trustworthy, a long-term valid team member. Yeah, that is a great observation. You're absolutely right. Jim, such a joy to finally have you. It's been a long time in the making. <laughs> Mia Kulpa again. And uh, great, great book. And, and um, you know, I cannot, what, why, what I liked apart from, of course, it's content. It is very hands-on. It is a short read. It's to the point and it's real. It is so real and relatable because of it. And so I think it can make a big difference uh, in acting at the executive part, being an executive yourself in doing your own homework inside and then implementing it with your team is a process. Yeah. It will take time. But thank you so it much for be. being with us here. Thanks for the oh, book. Thank you for the, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Again, it was a, a pleasure to be with you. Excellent. Thank you so much, my dear Mentory TV community. I hope you enjoyed the conversation this time with Jim Blake, the Zen executive. Have a look at this book. I thought it was extremely enlightened, even though I always thought myself of continuing to be enlightened. And yeah, from crisis to creation, these are the kind of things you want to be looking at. And not only when there is a crisis. And most importantly, stay curious. See you next time.